further ado, I will introduce our second keynote of day two of Own Your Growth. This is Nathan Latka. So he grew up or he grew his dorm room business to 5 million in revenue when he was just 21 years old. Uh, before he dropped out, he passed 10,000 customers and built his team up to 20 people, including hiring his old college professor. He now runs a SaaS database at getlatka.com and runs the SaaS podcast, The Top Entrepreneurs. You can find that on his website. We'll share the link to that podcast as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Nathan Latka. Sarah, we're going to stop right there. It's not going to get any better than that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Guys, it's so good to see you. Now, look, I am, you know, I have been just overwhelmed with Zoom calls over the past many months, like I'm sure many of you have. So I have a couple slides, but I'm going to do way more talking to you guys in the chat. I see Carol Myers, David Fox, Ethan Galloway here in the Zoom chat. You can ask questions. I'll also be in the live chat group on Slack. I'm watching both of them as I present and we'll do a lot of screen sharing here. So there's three things that I want to touch on today. And I think these all relate to SaaS and revenue in general. First, yes or no, just to make sure chat's working and questions are working. Have you guys seen all these brands publish books? You saw Drift do it. You've seen HubSpot do it when they branded inbound marketing. Every brand is now publishing books. And they're, you know, some books are great, but many of them are terrible. Uh, it's a big promotion packed in a book. So what I want to do is we're going to talk about three things again. How I drew my first SaaS business to about $5 million in sales. Second, how I got a book deal with the number one publishing house in the world, Random House. And then how we went on to launch that and sold 30,000 copies and hit the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. And I was a nobody, folks. I mean, if you're watching right now, thinking about doing a book thing, I mean, these tactics I think you're going to enjoy. And lastly, I'm going to jump into how I launched a podcast and grew it to 10 million downloads. And again, instead of just going through slides, I'm going to screen share if that's cool with you guys. Lots of screen sharing. So again, I'll be watching your comments come in. Again, I'm in the live chat channel on Slack. So I see your guys' names. I really love the back and forth feedback. That's the best way to talk to me while we're presenting and going through this. I will be asking you guys a bunch of questions and watching the Q&A uh, here on, on Zoom. So feel free to jump in. All right. So what I want to start first with is uh, the one that is maybe most relevant, right? Which is sales and specifically sales for the SaaS company. So I'm going to share my screen with you here real quick, jump into the deck. And again, as you guys can see, I am monitoring here in Slack that live chat. So feel free to engage in the right here. Okay. All right. So jumping into the slide deck, I want to start off with the biggest mistake I made. Now, can you, can you guys read this right here where my mouse is? Do you see that price? Now you might oh, have yeah. no context on you might have no context on this, right? And here's the following context. This was a message uh, I contact, big email marketing provider, sent me, you can see here, to Nathan Latka. You can read it here on my screen. It's the actual contract, October 20th, 2011. Now, I launched this company. It was called Heyo or Lejour back in the day in 2010. And what this letter is that you're looking at on my screen is I contact saying, Nathan, I'm going to read it, part B. We'd love to buy your company. The purchase price will be up to $6.5 million and will be paid in the following manner. Now, I thought I was, you know, the best thing since, you know, sliced bread and decided to turn this offer down, which is one of the biggest mistakes of my life because I went on in that SaaS company to raise a little bit of venture capital. The VCs ended up blocking this deal when I still owned 70% of the company. It was a big mistake. Now, all of these are like, you know, oh, poor me, what a horrible mistake. It still is obviously great traction. So I want to get into the nitty gritty of the first million in sales that we drove. And instead of walking you through countless strategies and trying to tell you guys to like be everywhere at all times, I hope you're cool with that. I'm just going to show you one tactic we used over and over again. You've probably heard of it, but I bet, I bet you haven't optimized it. Here it is. I know, surprising, right? You look at what's on my screen right now and you go, what is this thing? It looks like a kindergartner drew a line on an Etch-a-Sketch. What is this? Well, what this is, this is the actual formula, the template, the, the, the diagram we follow when we gave webinars. We drove $5 million in sales at our first SaaS company. I was 19 at the time between 2000 and, sorry, 2015 and, sorry, 2000. Uh, 10, 10 in 2015. And so a lot of these sales came through webinars, but it's because we perfected this shape you see on my screen. So here's how it works. Follow along with me here. This is the start. And along the bottom, these are minutes. So two minutes, four minutes, six minutes, 10 minutes in, 40 minutes in, 60 minutes in. And you notice this kind of shape. Okay. We'll get into the shape in a second. 
But first, let me talk through the, the critical thing that most people ignore on webinars. How many of you guys have been on a webinar before? And do not lie to me. Do not lie to me. How many of you guys have been on a webinar before and you are excited about it, you go into it, but like at your first chance you get, you minimize the screen. You forget about it, right? You might even be, have this minimized right now. You're just listening to my voice. So the trick with any good webinar is you've got to get people not just to register, not just to show up. Hey, Kenneth, I see in the live chat questions there. Not just to uh, show up, but also engage, watch the end, and then ideally buy. So back to the chart here, I'll put it back up on my screen. How do we use this chart to do that, right? Well, we did it through three critical ways. The first way we did it is by encouraging people to do this, these teal spots. So you want to make sure that people listen to you. But here's the problem with that. Most webinars, it's one voice. And this might be happening to you guys right now. I'm only six minutes into the presentation. My voice has now sunk into your background. It's pa you're passively listening. So what you have to do when you're giving a webinar, a compelling webinar that sells, is once every 10 minutes or so, you have to break the pattern of your voice. So you do that by unmuting somebody else. That's one of the things I love doing here actually on Zoom, but I don't think I can unmute you guys, unfortunately, but you unmute people, right? Second, play a video with someone else's audio. Or lastly, if you have a co-host, let the co-host talk that breaks up your voice and gets people to re-engage. The second, there's three of these tactics. The first is listening. It's, we're gonna appeal to all the three key senses here. So listening, auditory. Second, looking. Again, many of you guys have minimized my screen right now. But do you see this right here? Right where my mouse is? See, I'm using this tactic on you as I do it. Many of you guys just reopen the Zoom window to see what I was pointing at. That's exactly what you wanna do. Say, do you see that? or read this text right here, or I'm moving to the next slide. This gets people to actually reopen the Zoom or the presentation window, the webinar that they've minimized and actually look at your slides. You wanna use that tech tactic, one of these three key words, every 10 minutes as well. So we have looking, sorry, we have listening, we have looking. Can you guess what the last one is? The actual interaction, engagement. Again, you want a pattern break once every 10 minutes. The best way to drive engagement on a webinar is to encourage people to take notes, to answer a poll, or I've already done this many times with you guys, tell me in the questions. Again, I'm in Slack, I'm here on the Zoom, I'm looking at the Q&A. So listening, looking, and interacting. Now, if you're gonna take a screenshot from this first part of the webinar, this first part of the presentation here with Predictable Revenue and their crew, this is the money shot. Okay, this is the absolute million dollar webinar formula, okay? Every teal is listening, every purple is looking, and every uh, yellow is interacting, right? Through the first 60 minutes, 45 minutes really. So now you're asking, Nathan, what's the up and the down? Well, this is critical. One of the things and what you need to do is you need to build a story arc in your webinar. You know, a lot of these webinars are so boring. I mean, it's like two co-presenters. There's clearly a massive affiliate deal. It's so boring. It's like a bad demo where you can't ask any questions and you're like sick and tired of it and just want to get out of it. You need to actually entertain like a Netflix movie. So let's say your product that you're selling. Actually, I don't know what product you guys are selling. Tell me in the, in the live chat on Slack, what products are you guys selling? I'll see if I can get any real-time feedback here. This might be tricky because I don't know if there's a lag, but, and Sarah, you can help me out too. Uh, if you see any coming in. Um, okay, okay, good. Oh, you guys are in the in the chat. This is great. So Senzi Steinberger said online courses. Phil Prince said real estate CRM. Sarah Hicks said BDR as a service, recruiting automation, email anti-phishing solution. Okay, let's do um, Phil Prince. I'm going to pick on you. Is that cool, man? Real estate CRM. So your webinar hierarchy, the storytelling, is going to sound something like this. You always want to start with a negative. I know this sounds horrible, but humans are better wired to pay attention to fear than they are something that feels good. They're, that people want to stay alive first, and then they can experience the upside. So you want to start with the fear. So the real estate CRM fear, and you want to start with the littlest fear. The littlest fear, Phil, in your webinar might say, hey guys, I'm Phil. Welcome to my webinar. We're going to talk about real estate CRMs. Now, a lot of you guys jumped on this, and you're not quite sure if you should be here. You might actually exit out in the next 60 seconds. But what if I told you this? If you aren't currently using 
this weird three-step plan in your real estate CRM, you are missing out on three deals each month where we've seen the average commission be $10,000. I want to make sure you don't miss out on that. And then walk through that in the first five minutes. You then want to talk about a little high point. So negative point, you're missing the deals. Then fill high point. Our CRM uniquely integrates with your Gmail account. So you don't have to do any data entry. And we're constantly keeping track of your deals. So every morning, you know exactly where to start your day based off who opened and who replied. And that's the big win. So Phil, continuing down with your sequence. Guys, I'm going to share my screen again here. Continuing down with this sequence, Phil, your next line would be, a little bit bigger negative, and then a bigger negative, and then a really big, big, big negative. So the big, big, big negative, at this point you're at minute 30 to 35 in the webinar, you might say, did you guys know, when you look at all the real estate agents in the country, the top 5% in, turn of, in terms of gross earners all spend at least an hour a day in their CRM. Not only that, they spend almost $30,000 a year updating and maintaining their CRM. And watch this, Phil. We're going to pivot to the positive. What if I told you there was a way to get the same CRM that these rock stars were using for just $1,000 a year, right? Or, or whatever. I'm using him as an example, guys. But you all should be doing this mental model. A negative, something bad, something bad, something bad, something bad. Then what you solve, what you solve, what you solve, what you solve, right? And then here's what happens. At minute 45, you put up your pitch. And then you mute yourself and you say, hey guys, go here to this link to purchase. And when you see these sales start coming in, you unmute people who have purchased, right? So I might see, for example, there's nothing for sale on this, uh, on this webinar, but let's say that I just saw, I see Pablo with Global Trade Management is in the chat. Pablo, I might see you purchase. I'd say, Pablo, I saw you just purchased on our back end for, you know, a hundred bucks a month. I'm going to unmute you. Pablo, why the heck did you purchase on a webinar? No one buys anything, especially a real estate serum on a webinar. Why'd you buy? And Pablo's going to go, oh my gosh, I've always wondered how these top earners do it. I just decided to purchase. I'm like the small guy down here in Austin, Texas. I can't wait to get going. And you see other people start buying. And then when people stop buying from Pablo's testimonial, you mute Pablo and you unmute someone else who bought. And then guys, this becomes like HGTV. You unmute people at the end of the webinar who purchased. You let them brag about your product and why they purchased, and it drives more sales. This is the exact formula that we used, okay, when we were growing our first million dollars at my first SaaS company, Heyo. So guys, yes or no in the, in, the, uh, in the chat here on Zoom? Valuable there? That was the first section of the presentation today, driving sales in webinars. Yes or no? Valuable? Again, I, I have to like, we all have valuable time. So if this is like boring, I end the call right now and I go out to the pool outside and I relax and I work on this beautiful tan, right? Okay, good. Because <laughs> they're saying valuable. I love that. All right, let's move forward to the next section. All right, here we go. Next thing I want to chat about and jump into is podcasts. Podcasts. Now guys, I don't want to beat around the bush here. This is my data. How many podcast hosts do you know jump on and just show you the data? That's the data. Can you guys read that download number? 10,716,982 podcast downloads for my podcast called SaaS Interviews with CEOs, Startups, and Founders. Hey, Sarah, are you jumping in? I heard, it, I heard someone say something. No? Okay. No, I didn't say anything. All right. No worries. Okay, guys. So second part here, podcast downloads. Out of curiosity, how many of you guys are thinking about launching your own podcast? Just say podcast in the chat. Podcast in the chat. Anyone thinking about launching their own show? Okay, Steven said yes. Uh, Ricardo said yes. Okay, good. So there, there are people thinking about launching their own show. Colin Stewart, Colin, good to see you, man. Uh, launching podcast to us. Yuri said yes. Okay, guys, here is the key to podcasts, and everybody gets this wrong. Smart people do horribly on podcasts. They think, oh, NPR, Planet Money, it's an academic thing. If I'm just say really intelligent things, people will listen. Wrong. There are so many smart people with podcasts that get zero downloads, zero downloads. They spend a lot of money. It's a big failure. Big, big failure. Doesn't work. The question is why? Folks, podcasts is about entertainment first and educating second. If you don't know how to hold an audience and entertain, it doesn't matter how smart you are, what you're selling or what you're teaching, it will not work. You have to entertain. So what I'll tell you guys about this and the mental model that I used is ask yourself, what reality show do you want to model your business podcast after? Any Survivor fans in the audience here? Any Survivor folks? 
Ethan, David Fox. David Fox sounds like a survivor name to me, right? David Fox wins immunity. Julie Hessen, Kimball North, any, <laughs> any, any Survivor fans? So why do we watch Survivor, if you're not familiar? It's a 47-minute produced show, right, with 13 minutes of, of advertisements. In that 47 minutes, though, guys, in the first eight minutes, what happens? What happens? There's a reward challenge. Someone's going to win something. The second eight to 10 minutes, what happens? An immunity challenge. Somebody wins immunity. And why do we always watch until the end? Tribal council, someone gets voted off the island. You have to think about your podcast like a reality show. Let's say you're gonna do a 30 minute podcast. The first 10 minutes, what dopamine hit are you gonna give your audience where they're gonna keep listening for the next hit? What about the second hit, the third hit? Okay. Yes or no, guys, is this the making sense? It can, you can tell me in the chat, is that making sense? You have to have open loops that make your audience very curious and make them listen to the end. Another analogy I use here when I work with people launching their own shows is think about why we watch sports. There's always a side and you're watching because your team is playing. You're rooting for your team. When someone turns on your podcast, you have to give them someone to root for or, this is more powerful, root against in the first 60 seconds. On my show, it is purposefully a hard hitting show. It is entertaining. If you've met me in person, I'm a big teddy bear. But if you read the Vox article on me, they call me a con man. The question is why? The show is entertaining. I want that Vox article. I want the one star reviews of people saying, Nathan, your show is horrible. You're rude, you cut off guests. It's entertainment. It's done on purpose done on purpose, right? So you want people to love you or hate you, root for you or against you, whether it's you or your podcast guest in the first 60 seconds. And so type in a couple of your industries again, guys, in the chat. I'm like, I'll do a real life example here because I think you guys like the real life examples, right? Brooklyn in the chat, Freddie, Kenneth, you guys are all saying awesome tips in the live chat. I want you guys to know I appreciate that. I'm giving you guys little little wavy emojis right now in the Slack group. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you, Freddie. I appreciate you. Thank you, Kenneth. There we go. Good. All right. Live example here. Let me see what you guys are saying in the Zoom chat. All right. What I'm seeing, I say, um, okay. Z, I like this one. ZS, and I don't know who that is, uh, said, uh, said email marketing. All right, guys. So here's how I would think about building the podcast for ZS. Email marketing. What is something very controversial about email marketing? Well, brainstorm with me here, guys, in the chat. I think people always debate around how frequently you should send. So once a week, once a day, once a month. Sarah Hicks is dead on. Are you like oversending or undersending? People debate about how aggressive you should be with getting email opt-ins on your website. They debate around subject lines. Should they be long or short? They debate around should the email be plain text so it looks like a one-on-one -on -one conversation or super professional and designed. Have you seen those? Those super professional designed emails that we just close because it's clearly corporate. All these things are things that people are thinking about. So what you want to do if I'm building an email marketing podcast is I would start off with, with something uh, like, um, maybe I'd call it the long and short podcast, right? I'd pick one of these themes we just discussed and go hard on it, the long or short. So in each episode, I'm interviewing a new marketer that does email marketing. And the big question is short subject lines or long, long subject lines, right? Or a designed email versus plain text. In the first five minutes, I'm getting their answer on that. And I'm intentionally taking the opposite side to create conflict. So if the guest says, Nathan, I believe in short subject lines, I'm going to say, yes, no, you're so wrong. I believe in long subject lines. Here's the evidence why. Debate. The audience then picks a side. They're hooked in the first five minutes. Second five minutes, I talk about length of email or design or not design. And last five minutes, I wrap up with something else, right? Does that make sense? Does that, does that real life example give you guys an idea? Maricelo Snoro, Maruti Sandeep in the comments. Does that give you an idea of how I would structure these shows? Okay, cool. I'm glad this is valuable. Now, guys, we are 21 minutes in. You have a choice now. You have a choice Tell me, and I'm a little greedy here. I want to see my thing here on Predictable Revenue get the most engagement. So if you put it in the live chat and Slack, that's great. Or in Zoom, that's great. Or actually on 
predictive uh, predictive revenue, the site, the actual the site for the conference, tell me the following. You have a choice. Do you want me to actually screen share with you and show you how I go through the production steps of the podcast, produce each episode for under $20 and still make many thousands per episode and sponsor revenue? Or do you want me to go and jump into how to publish and launch a book that hits the Washington Journal bestseller? So podcast or book? What do you want me to do for the next five minutes? Podcast or book? Podcast. Okay, Jillian's saying podcast, podcast, pod. Okay, here's what I'll do. Instead of spending 10 more minutes or five more minutes on one, I'll do you know two and a half on the podcast and some on the book, but I'm going to speed up. Is that cool with you guys? I'm going to sp- speed up, okay? So stick with me here. I'm going to share a screen. I'm going to do this very, very fast. I'm going to speed up. Here's how I do the podcast. Okay, each guest that comes on, I record via Skype. That Skype call goes into this Ecamm interview, okay? So here's my last interview with Beamer CEO, Spencer Kuhn, 17 minutes. I export each as an MP4 file, right? One MP4 file, that gets the video. Then I export each as an MP3. So my voice and his voice, separate audio tracks. That then goes directly into a Google Drive file, right? So let's go, episode 2222. We've recorded over 2,000 episodes. How crazy is that? Episode 2222, here are the three files. Again, the, the video and the two audio tracks. I then use a guy on Fiverr. Okay? I use a guy on Fiverr who I pay $3 per episode to edit the show. He puts in the beginning. He puts in the sponsor in the middle. He produces it. He puts it on Libsyn. Okay? All you have to do is type in podcast editing on Fiverr. It's very, very simple. Full disclosure, I love them. They also pay me. They're a big sponsor of mine, but I use them a ton, right? So anywhere between three and 10 bucks. You shouldn't spend more than 10 bucks per episode on editing, okay? Tons of people to pick from here. Once they edit it, they publish that directly into Libsyn, okay? L-I-B-S-Y-N. It's my podcast host. And here you're gonna see a bunch of my download data. So you guys can read this number on my screen. This was 12,000 downloads just on May 16th. There's a lot of podcasts I know in the B2B space. They don't get 12,000 downloads total in their first year. We're getting that daily. And again, I already showed you guys, we've got over 10 million total real-time downloads on the show. So that Fiverr, that same person I pay on Fiverr, also will come here into Libsyn and schedule the show and the release date. Okay, so you can see here, scheduled for release. Here they are. So this is scheduled through May 31st. So he puts the title in here. He puts all the metadata in here. The metadata is the description on the show right? The details, the artwork all right here, CEO Living Security. That then will go live on iTunes, okay? It will also go out, you can set this up in Libsyn, to go out on Spotify, Google Play, iHeart, and all these other feeds. So now if you guys go into Spotify, for example, since Rogan obviously just signed a big deal there, we'll give them some love and go to podcasts. You can go in here and you should see our podcast, right? Here it is. SaaS CEO Interviews. Okay, and people can follow along. Boom, 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 boom. Now, I don't believe I get as many downloads on Spotify as I do on other outlets, but I'll show you guys the downloads since we're being super transparent here. I think this is going to grow over time. All right, so here you can see we've gotten about 53,000 people have played an episode on, my, on the podcast on Spotify, 37,000 have streamed, 7,300 have listened, right? Have listened. So if I go to catalog, SAS interviews, okay, and about 3,000 people have subscribed to the podcast. It's just on Spotify. Okay, so this is very different than the data I just saw you on Libsyn or on iTunes. Okay, this is just Spotify, all right? So anyways, that is how you go from recording the podcast, producing it, getting it out, how I spend money, right, how I make money on the show. Uh, guys, was that valuable? That was quick. I went through that extremely fast. You have to go and watch the replay of this when the Predictable Revenue Crew posts it. Was that valuable, though? All, <laughs> all right. People are saying I'm going to rewatch. So Vika said, can you repeat that, please? Phil said, just subscribe. I can't repeat it, guys. We have so much more to cover. And Sarah, you just, you're going to just cut me off here. So I'm going to go now into the book. Okay, I'll go into the book. Kenneth, I see you in the live chat, said thanks on Slack. I appreciate that, guys. All right, let's go into the book. Okay, the book. I'm going to share my screen with you. Share screen. Open back up, and we're going to get in now to the book. By the way, guys, podcast stuff, super valuable. I now get all these CEOs on my show. Automatic CEO, he, you know, the creative WordPress, Freshworks founder, GitLab founder, Manny Medina founder of Outreach, 
Frank Bean, CEO of Looker, who sold it to Google literally four weeks after he came on the show, sold it to Google for $2 billion, Ping Identity Carbon Black. A podcast is such a valuable asset for you to have. You can connect with anyone once you build a following. Okay, again, so the show's doing really well. Let's talk about the book, right? The book. So again, here it is. Right there, if you guys can still see my face, published with Portfolio Penguin, massive publisher. Here is the secret to getting a great book deal, okay? And I'll start with the end. So here's what happened. I picked up the newspaper when we launched. Here it is on my screen. And you can see what rank were we in the paper. Number three, had to be a capitalist, Nathan Latka. We had on day one, the Britons purchased it, the Chinese purchased it, folks in Thailand purchased it, Romania and Korea. So it was immediately syndicated worldwide. NASDAQ put our face up in Times Square. It was a huge success very quickly. Here's why. Publishers already loved me. They were putting their book authors on my podcast during their book launch. You can see here Maria putting Tom, who wrote a book for HarperCollins, on my podcast. I would email them when the show went live and say, look, I increased the book's Amazon rank by 10,000 points. We drove a lot of sales. So all these publishers knew I could drive sales, and that's what enabled me to get a killer agent. I ended up signing with an agent called Jim Levine. He's the same guy that works with Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella on his book, Hit Refresh, Richard Cialdini, Dan O'Reilly, Predictable Revenue, or Irrational, The Four with Scott Galloway, Principles with Ray Dalio, Eric Schmidt at Google. He works with all, he's the best agent by far in the business category. So I got him. So here's what he said to me. First email, August 8, 2016. Nathan, good speaking with you just now. FYI, I'm attaching a set of references that will hopefully give you a sense of how we work. So he's asking to work with me. Here are my references, right? How crazy is that? So I did my research and signed. This is what my first book proposal looked like. You should screenshot this. If you screenshot it and post it in the Slack group, showing you're paying attention, I will reply to you personally on a DM on the Slack group, Predictable Revenue, with a special surprise that I can't get to in this totally free, but extra book stuff, extra podcast stuff. Screenshot this, put it in the Slack group. So this was the first book proposal sent. Notice the working title, Money in One Hour Day. Obviously, the title ended up being How to Be a Capitalist Without Any Capital, right? But this was the first proposal. Now, this obviously edits over time. Okay, you can see here, make theme is make money, work less, win battles, right? And then talk about my platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the email list, the speaking gigs that I do. You want to cover all this stuff. Scrolling further down, again, you see the podcast. It was a huge, huge aspect. I only had 2 million downloads at that point, right? So it's grown significantly, but showcase that and then let them create a bidding war. So my agent set that proposal out to a bunch of the top publishing houses. And look at what he said here. Again, Jim Levine, top agent in the world, worked with Microsoft CEO, Eric Schmidt, everyone, Satya Nadella. He pushed, pushed it out to publishers and said, I think Nathan could be the next Tim Ferriss. Right, boom, boom, boom. He then got a bunch of replies. Some people like Simon & Schuster said, I, Jim, I can see the similarities there. Okay, but I think Nathan's material is all over the place. I love this. I frame these people that turn me down. I frame it because in the book is a big success and they missed out. Now, here's the trick to getting those publishers to give you a massive book deal. You want to pre-sell your book. Do you want to pre-sell your book? I can guarantee you what you're about to see is something you've never seen done before. I came up with this. It's a first. No one's seen it. And I frankly, I think it's genius. All I did all I did is I sent a signed invoice to the publisher saying, we're going to sell a lot of books, much easier than expected. One phone call. A lot of companies will do this. So what is this invoice attachment that I sent? Well, here's what it looked like. I emailed Calvin, who was one of the CEOs I had on my podcast, right? And I said, hey, Calvin, listen, I want to sell you a book sponsorship. If you agree right now and sign a contract to purchase 500 copies, which would be about $5,000 in spend for you, I'll put a one pager in the book about Simplero. Okay. I call it book sponsorship, just like you'd sponsor a podcast or sponsor anything else. Why would you not do this book sponsorship? Makes sense. You guys are watching this going, Oh my gosh, this is genius. But then you're thinking, wait a second, isn't the book going to be trash if it's a big book full of advertisements? Well, then I'd ask you, how did I hit it? The Wall Street Journal bestseller list. Why did 30,000 people purchase it? You can sell a sponsorship as branded content and still make the content valuable. That's the trick. So we pre-sold almost $30,000 worth of the book before there was anything written. In fact, here's a check I got from Botkeeper, $2,000 check. They pre-purchased a bunch of the books. Yeah, this was, guys, this was before I wrote up anything. So 7,000 in revenue, I haven't written a dang thing. I mean, this is how you freaking do it, right? 
Okay. Here's the one pager I use to sell the book sponsorship. You should screenshot this and send it to your design team. Have them create the same thing. I came up with a, a cover. Obviously the cover looks much different in print. And I said, here are the sponsor options. 2,000, 10,000, 20,000, 200,000, right? Boom, boom, boom. Here's what you get. Three sentences built into the book. Shout out on the podcast. You know, five sentences built into the book. 10 sentences built into the book. You see how I did here? Okay, this is how I did it. Okay. And then boom, okay, celebratory drink. We signed a big deal with Portfolio Random House. Leah says, Nathan, we're so excited to get you on the table. Let's have a big drink. I'm immensely excited working with you as an editor. Let's get this published. So I didn't write the book. A lot of you guys are going, okay, that's interesting, but I don't know that I could sit down and actually write a book. Well, you guys remember, I'm a podcaster, right? I'm a podcaster, right? I'm gonna touch base with you guys real quick. Am I boring the hell out of you? Are you still with me? me just tell me in the chat you with me liana svitka is this valuable you guys gotta egg me on here because i have so many things i could be by the pool i could be relaxing getting more starbucks coffee the banana nut bread i love that stuff i love that stuff are you are you liking this okay we're gonna keep going we're gonna keep going we're gonna keep going so you guys are thinking well wait a second i can't sit down and write a book you know how many pages in this book there's 60,000 freaking words. I bet you guys, if you're like me, you can't sit down and write a one blog post. So what about a book? Well, remember, I, I couldn't do a book. So here's what I did. Here's what I did. Follow me here. Oh, Angela said, great skin. Angela, thank you. This stuff is about as pure. I and mean, look at this jawline here. It's about as good skin as you can get. There's a bit of a routine, Angela. We'll talk about that afterwards, okay? All right, so here's what I did. I'm gonna share my screen. Now you will not expect what I'm about to show you on my screen. I can guarantee you, none of you will predict the website I'm about to go to. Sarah's sitting on the edge of her seat going, oh my gosh, what is Nathan about to do? This is what I did. I signed the book deal and it was a massive book deal. They sent me a lot of money up front. This is the first thing I went to. I'm not gonna say a word. I'm just gonna let you watch. This is what I did. You guys know where I'm going with this, don't you? I'm thinking, you know what? I'm just gonna go find a beautiful place off the grid with internet. I'm just gonna rent it for a week. Here it is, Tiller, Oregon, this beautiful tree house, a nice little jacuzzi, great sunsets. I can picture myself sitting there writing this whole book in a week. I reserve it. I go there, sitting on the bench. Squirrel runs by squirrel. And I'm like, oh, that jacuzzi would feel good, but I can't write in the jacuzzi. I get nothing done. I write about two words, failure, failure. I can't write a book this way. So here's what I did instead. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. I'm a podcaster. I should just do this. Hey, Maria, this is the chapter 10 you stuff under your questions, under the subtext, other big points to hit. So... If you're reading this chapter and you're going, wow, this involves a lot of red tape and it's going to be way over my head. How do I buy a business? I've never run a business. I wouldn't know the first thing about. Guys, that's me talking to my editor via voice memos on my phone. Chapter 11, part two, 11 minutes. I just basically recorded a bunch of mini podcasts via the voice memo app on my phone that sent to my editor. My editor then transcribed it and made it all flow. They then sent me the written version of a book and I then went through and embedded a bunch, a bunch of screenshots in the book, right? Again, this is what I mean. Like, don't force yourself to do stuff, right? That doesn't fit your natural model. I'm a podcaster. Why would I try and write a 60,000 word book? I should do the audiobook first, right? Hello, hello, audiobook first, okay? Does that make sense? Are you guys going, if, if you just have like an aha moment, you're watching this, going, this is like a great session. Nathan makes so much common sense. Just like freak yeah, or aha, or head explosion, or mind blown, like Ricardo in the comments, <laughs> right? This is how it works. So anyways, I get the book. Here it is. Bada bing, bada boom. And then what I do, Keith said, Kenneth said, smart move in the live chat. Appreciate that. All right, so guys, here's what I did. You can see the book here, okay? I wanted to make sure when anyone picked up this book, no matter what page they landed on, there was going to be a screenshot 
right? Or a bold title. Because I know if you view a screenshot, you're way more likely to then pick up the book and actually buy it. So look, actually, here's my, my calendar patterns. This is, this is my podcast process, how I batch podcast episodes in the book on page 22. In fact, I actually, guys, and my lawyers hated this. Look at this on page six. Those are my tax returns for my, SAS, my first SaaS company, where you see we passed $939,000 in sales. I put that on page six in the freaking book. It's one of the first thing people see. So again, audio to my editor. My editor transcribes, sends me the book. I then put in screenshots and the headlines to make the, the book addicting, like little pieces of popcorn, okay? Now, here was the next big debate with my publisher. If this was going to be in every airport around the country and on every bookshelf, I wanted my face on the cover. But guys, no joke, the gall. Look at what my publisher emailed me when I said I want my face on the cover. Look at this. Read this email. Can you guys read that? The real risk of putting your face on the cover is you might alienate people, right? Ridiculous. You're right. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Putting on the cover means we can't use that space to illustrate the book's concepts. To Angela's point, Angela just said, Nathan, you have beautiful skin. I mean, look at this book cover. Look at the comb over. Look at this Tom Ford suit. Look at the no socks. This thing, my face freaking sells, baby. It's sell. You want to put your face on the cover, especially if you're going to work your butt off and sell it. So I had to push and push and push. Finally got my face on the cover. Here we are doing a big photo shoot in New York City at Milk Studios, this particular location with a very talented celebrity photographer. These were some of the early versions of the book, right? Early versions of the book. Again, faces sell. That's why people put faces in Facebook advertisements. People click on faces. I wanted my face on the cover. This is some of the editing process. I'm taking you guys really behind the scenes here. I printed off all the color choices, Pantone 2192C. We run through all these edits. Here's the trick with writing a hit book. Take that book, the cover. Okay, take just the cover, print it off that you edit. Wrap it on another book and go sit at a bookshop and put your book on the shelf like this and watch. This is before you publish the book. You just have the cover design. This isn't my book. It's just the cover on another book. Just like you would test Facebook ads and click-through rates, count how many people walk by and don't pick it up. So if you count 100 people that walk by and 96 don't pick it up and only four reach out to pick it up, great. Now try a different cover and see if you can get 10 people to pick it up. The thing that drives book sales is people grabbing your book. It's like the email headline. The content of the email doesn't matter if they don't open the subject line. Same with the book. The 60,000 words inside do not matter unless they pick up and grab your book. So test your copy, your color, your image, your creative design by doing this on bookshelves, okay? Let your Facebook audience play along. Here's A, here's B. Let people pick A or B, left or right. Drives a lot of good social engagement. And then here's what you want to do pre-launch. Okay, the key to launching big is getting a lot of Amazon pre-sales. This is the copy that you should use. Copy and paste, baby. Screenshot this page if you need to. I sent this to hundreds of LinkedIn connections. I said, have a book coming out Tuesday. Would you up for pre-ordering? Would mean a lot to me. Here's the trick. Here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. If you reply here with a screenshot of the receipt, I'll send you a financial document my lawyers wouldn't let me put in the book but I think you'll find valuable. Here it is. Okay. Boom. Buy a book. People start sending me screenshots. I then send them the chapter. My legal, my lawyers wouldn't let me put in the book right as a reward. This drove thousands in pre-sales thousands. Okay. All sending me the buy screenshots. I then collect all those buyer emails and put together a lookalike audience to then target with Facebook ads. See what I'm doing here? All pre-launch. Okay. Look at how aggressive this ad is. You don't need the audio, but just look how I'm ripping up my book. If you're watching this, you're thinking, wait, I want to hear the audio. What is he doing? I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing in the ad, right? I'm ripping out pages saying, if you get the book, you're going to get all this. This is smart stuff. People don't do this, guys, but it works. It works, okay? That's what I did. And the book did well. I put together these little JPEGs, right? I opened the book, flipped through it highlight things, how I got a Rolls Royce for free with small Instagram following. I put that in the book, right? These things work. I take out the copy like a CNN blurb and stick it in there. 
Okay. I launched on product hunt, which drove about a thousand clicks back to the book without a capitalist book. Okay. Here's what that looked like. All right. 983 upvotes, huge success. Number one product of the day. Okay, did very well, drove sales. I updated all my social banners to this. Okay. And then I launched with an exclusive CEO event. I filled up this very fancy boardroom overlooking Bryant Park in New York City. We put the books up everywhere. I invited a high powered software CEOs who'd been on my show. And this was the official book launch. We then launched, we were the number one new release in startups. Okay. And even today, guys, before we wrap up, we're getting close to wrapping up here. Before we wrap up, even today, like if I go on Amazon and I go to, let's just look at like, uh, let's look at the Kindle version and I'll scroll down here to the bottom. You can see we're ranking number 36 in startups and it's a year and a half after launch. That's crazy. That is crazy, right? So like, let's go down to 36. So here we are, number 36. So we're beating out Richard Branson. We're beating out Gary Vee. Right, again, here we are beating out Gary Vee, beating out Scott Galloway, right? With the four. I mean, we're beating out these high, high powered people with much larger followings than I have, right? Lewis Howes, the founder of Square, Mark Benioff, Salesforce CEO, okay? So anyways, I hope that was valuable to you guys. Scale of zero to 10, just the book stuff. 10 being, this was drop dead, most amazing 10 minute section I've seen in a long time. What'd you guys think? Sarah doesn't count. Sarah and Colin don't count because they're with predictable revenue. What did you guys think? Okay, good. I'm getting, if you guys loved it, you can throw in exclamation points and plus marks and crazy characters from a, from a Japanese dictionary. You guys enjoy that? All right. Jack Brewer said yes. David Fox said yes. A hundred. Good, good, good. So guys, just to summarize, okay, just to summarize here before I finish up with a couple questions, again, feel free to put your questions in Slack right now and I'll get to those in a second. This is what launch looked like. I was live on Cirrus XM. I was live on the New York Stock Exchange. We were put up in NASDAQ in Times Square, right? You can see the video right there. I mean, amazing branding content, right? Uh, we hit the top 200 release in all, okay, this was in all of uh, uh, Amazon, not just business books, but look here, top 150 books in all books on all Amazon. It's a really crazy launch, okay, did extremely well right? Booksellers, booksellers. And then the publisher writes me and says, congrats, you are a number three Wall Street Journal bestseller. We'll be printed tomorrow if you can grab it. Okay. That is from Penguin Random House. So we did very well. And here is that beautiful part in the book or in the paper. I open the paper. I go down here to hardcover business. Number three, Nathan Latka, right? Number three, Nathan Latka. And this is above like Jocko with extreme ownership, bad blood. Again, great people. Uh, who else? Dave Ramsey, James Clear with Atomic Habits, Jim Collins with Good to Great. We ranked higher than all of them. So guys, that is how you build a successful book launch, right? That's how you do a book launch. So just summing up, okay, summing up, what I want to sum up here is we walked through over the past, and we went way over. I apologize for that, Sarah and, uh, and Colin. Over the past 43 minutes, I told you I'd show you how I drove 5 million in SaaS sales. I told you I'd drive 10 million podcast downloads. I told you, I show you how to launch a Washington best-selling book. We did all those three things. I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. It would mean a lot to me. I want to go to Predictable Revenue, the site where they see all the replays. And I want to see this one have the most comments and the most little like button clicks. Okay. If you guys do that, if you go on Slack and ask me questions, I will make sure to reply to you with a special extra piece of this. Maybe I'll send you... Um, some additional of the book tactics that I didn't talk about or how I got my second 5 million downloads on the podcast after the first 5 million or how I get any guests on uh, or maybe how we drove expansion revenue on the SaaS sales after we closed like a thousand dollar contract, how we'd get up to 5,000. But if you guys engage with me and engage in this content, I will reward you personally. I'll shoot you a DM with some extra content and uh, I can be found on Twitter at Nathan Latka. Sarah, what'd you think? Did we have fun? That was awesome. That was great. Sorry, we went way over. I apologize. I don't know. You're totally fine. There's a 15 minute kind of buffer in between you and the next guy anyway. So, or actually it's Lavinia, not the next guy. Uh, so we're all good. We've got time for Q and A. Let's have a look. Um, there are a couple in there. Uh, okay, we've cool. got one from Liana who says, what, what does everyone need to start a SaaS business? So maybe what's, what are the top three things you need? 
Yeah. So Leanna, in order to start uh, an order, and again, guys, you just saw the, in the chat, click that link to the, the Slack predictable revenue channel. That's where you can ask me questions and I can follow up with you via DMs. But to Liana, to your question here in Zoom, in order to start a SaaS business, look, I think it's a bit about, it's the wrong question, right? If you've got an idea, if you've got an idea and you found a developer to build it, by the way, my cheat sheet for finding a developer to build a quick MVP is TopTal, T-O-P-T-A-L.com. I use it for all my SaaS projects, but the key to get it going is to find something that you can build. You can sell on a recurring basis, keep your churn really, really low and scale it and grow it from there. I wouldn't just go out and say, I want to launch a SaaS business. Let me do a SaaS business. I also really recommend if you're getting into SaaS and you're not sure where to start uh, in the book, actually on pages 36 and 37, I talk about how I bought a SaaS business for a thousand dollars. It was a Chrome extension. It had a 70,000 person email list. Uh, I then opened up and put a paywall in for five bucks and grew it to about thirty six thousand dollars in sales very quickly. So don't forget, you don't don't you don't just have to get into SaaS by starting. You can also just cheat it and buy. Save yourself some time. Buy a company. Good question, Liana. Awesome, thanks, Nathan. Uh, the next one is anonymous. How many people do you contract out to do the technical tasks around all of your strategies? Yeah. So the podcast, there's two. Uh, but I have, I run all kinds of other stuff, guys. So like, if you see my screen here, part of the evolution uh, of the podcast was people saying, Nathan, how can I scan all your podcasts? And there isn't an easy way to do that. So what I did is this, I took every CEO I interviewed and put them on gitlatka.com. And so like what you see here, like, is if I go into, uh, let me just sort by revenue. We'll go into like Cvent, for example, right? You'll see here, this is the podcast interview, but we also tagged every data point out of the audio. So the revenue figure, if you see it's underlined, if you click it, it'll take you to the point in the podcast where he okay, says so I'm looking this. backwards. Yep. So basically we'll collect more than half a billion in cash this year. Yep. So collect half a billion in cash is what drove 500 million, that data point right here. So the audio from the podcast are now put out on the website so all of you guys can easily come in here and sort. Maybe you want to go into Liana's point and find companies that have less than 500 grand in revenue. So you sort and go there and you find small companies and go study those CEOs. Maybe you guys are raising a big funding round. So you want to go in here and look at people that have raised between, you know, 5 million up to 12 million. You go listen to those. So I have a bunch of freelancers that work on this. Right. All together, last month, I probably paid over 30 freelancers, as little as a dollar for a small task. I think the most I pay any single freelancer is maybe 500 bucks in a month because they did a lot of tasks over and over. Good question. Nice. Uh, the next one is, how much total did you spend on your book? So software, agent, all included. Yeah, guys, I mean, I, can, um, I can't tell this publicly. Just I know the replay is going out. The book was highly profitable for me from day one. They, they wrote me a massive multi six figure check. Again, if you DM me or if you engage with this or if you upvote it or comment in Slack, I'll DM you what the actual, the actual quantity was that we got for the book. But, but it, it was profitable from day one. So I basically took the big check that they wrote me. I said, I want to spend X percent on, um, by the way, the agent, you don't pay, I don't pay the agent. The agent fights to represent you and then they take a cut of whatever deal they get you. So um, it was profitable from day one. Didn't cost me anything. Nice. And last one here for now is from Simon Turner. What's your favorite question to ask that reveals the most about the potential success of the company you're interviewing? Very simple. When the when the when the show's going on, I'll say, Simon. So you've got like a three million dollar business. You're bootstrapped. Like if you got a check right now for ten million bucks to sell, it would be dumb for you not to take that, right? So you make a statement that kind of leads and then watch how aggressively they counter it, mm. right? So if you came back and said, no, Nathan, I freaking love this stuff. Like, I think we could get 30 million two years from now. We're cash flow positive. I don't need a check. My wife loves what I'm building. Like I have total freedom. You're like, wow, that's great. Now if they do the other, which is, you know, Nathan, that makes a lot of sense. I could use the cash right now. We're in a recession. There's this lockdown going on. I'll take the cash. All that's important is that they have a strong point. It doesn't matter which way they go, but you want to ask a polarizing question and force them into a very aggressive polarized answer. And the way they defend their answer is what you're looking for. The better defenders of any answer they give, the higher probability of success from the CEO perspective. Does that make sense, Simon? Good question. 
Yeah, great questions. Thank you guys for asking those. Um, as Nathan has mentioned, you can continue to engage with him in that Slack channel, in the live chat channel. Um, so if you have any more questions, I'm sure you guys have tons. That was that presentation was packed with so much information on so many topics. Um, so keep engaging with Nathan uh, in the number of ways that he's shared. We've shared with you the link to get to that uh, Slack channel uh, in the live chat. But yeah, thank you so much, Nathan, for for being our, our last keynote of Own Your Growth. What an incredible presentation. You guys bet. I'm sharing my screen now. I'm going to end the Zoom call, or Sarah's going to end the Zoom call here. I'm going to jump off, but I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes, you guys can see here on my screen, in the Own Your Growth Slack group. So I see Steven commented in here, uh, uh, R2, uh, Huber, Ethan. So guys, I'm going to jump in here now, and I'll reply to all you guys and engage there. So that's where, if you have follow-up questions, you guys can find me there. Sarah, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Thank you so much.